Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, How to Select a Rotating Torque Sensor. Your microphone will stay muted throughout the presentation. If you have questions, we will address them at the end of the presentation using the Q&A feature of WebEx. However, you're welcome to type in your questions at any time. Our presenter today is Mark Menda. Mark has 22 years of experience in repair, calibration, and day-to-day -day use of torque sensors. He's been with HBM for six and a half years and currently serves as the business development manager for Torque Products. Mark, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Krista, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Mark Minda, and I will be presenting the How to Choose a Rotating uh, Torque Sensor webinar. Why is the proper selection important of a rotating torque sensor? It is designed on purpose to be the weakest link in the drivetrain. Uh, the reason for this is to, do, is to direct the torque to a specific area and, and placing the strain gauges over that specific area. And in doing so, the sensing area becomes the weakest link. And if something catastrophic happens mechanically, the torque sensor can act as a very expensive mechanical fuse. So proper selection is important in order to uh, not have a mechanical failure. Also, what is important in the proper selection is the data from the torque sensor believable. It is important that the data is least uncertain as possible. And so making sure that all the electrical re requirements of the torque sensor are addressed allows you to acquire the best possible torque data and make your data more usable in your specific application. What we're going to go over today is in trying to choose the proper torque sensor, what to consider. Application considerations such as accuracy, capacity range, RPM rating, electrical outputs, response times, environmental considerations, and the proper strain gauge conditioning, uh, some dy dynamic considerations such as rotational effects, critical speeds, and extraneous loading, physical requirements such as size and mounting limitations of the torque sensor, uh, cost or budget requirements, and then the type of torque sensors available in the marketplace. The first thing you're going to notice when you go online to look at a, at a torque sensor is the data sheet. And the data sheet should generally be used as reference only. All of the values on the data sheet are, are taken in a lab environment, and, are, and most of the, the, the data is static, not dynamic or rotating. So all of the data on the data sheet should be used more for as a reference on how the torque sensor can perform, but may not be what the tor how the torque sensor actually re performs while spinning in your application. What is the accuracy? Generally, when most people term accuracy, they usually refer to nonlinearity as the requirement. However, accuracy is a lot more complicated than just nonlinearity, and we will go over that shortly. But in terms of accuracy, torque sensors vary in, in what types of accuracy they can be purchased at. Some torque sensors can be uh, viewed as very low uncertainty. These will be things like efficiency testing, friction loss text testing, or drag torque. And a torque sensor that might be used for this type of application would be an HBM T12. Then there is more of the general purpose applications, which could be considered as endurance testing, end of production test, or horsepower verification. And more of a general purpose type torque sensor would be an example of the HBM T40B. And then there are applications where higher uncertainty is acceptable. This may be assembly equipment, torque to turn applications, or fastener testing. And there are less accurate torque sensors available on the marketplace. An example of these would be the HBM T20 or T22. Measurement uncertainty of the torque sensor. This can become a quite complicated subject, uh, but generally there are six criteria held for measurement uncertainty in the, in the industry. The sensor output, linearity and hysteresis, temperature effect at zero, temperature effect at full scale, repeatability, and off-axis loading. And generally, when talking about off-axis loading, we're referring to axial, lateral, and bending moments. And if you use the, the data off of 
the data sheet supplied with the torque sensor, you can plug this into a formula, which is the sum of the, squ the squares, and come up with a general uncertainty number. However, if you use the data off the data sheet, the formula becomes a lot more complicated because it's not actual data, but yet data that is on a data sheet. And HBM does have the ability to quantify the measurement uncertainty using the data sheet. And we can supply that information to you if you would like. But again, measurement uncertainty is a lot more complicated to understand than just linearity or hysteresis. And it should be considered when choosing your torque sensor. How uncertain is the calibration data? Every torque sensor shows up with a piece of calibration data, and that is part of the uncertainty change. So it's important to know your vendor, what type of calibration equipment they have, and how uncertain their lab is. Generally, in the United States, uh, torque is not a controlled uh, measurement. So it is up to the, the vendor here in the United States to assure the customer that their lab is of some sort of accuracy. And generally, what it's done is it's a means of, of weights and measures. The weights are weighed, the arm is measured, and the instrumentation is calibrated. But there is no controlling entity to make sure that the procedures are, are held the same between vendor to vendor or that the equipment is actually working properly. In some countries, like in Germany, there are, are organizations called the PTB, which is kind of like the German version of NIST. And they actually control torque measurements in the country of Germany. And they will come in and certify your lab as being uh, a certified PTP lab for measuring torque. Uh, that is not generally done here in the United States. And that certification in Germany is called the DKD certification. And when you have one of these certifications, it helps to minimize the uncertainty of your calibration lab in general and to assure the customer that uh, the torque data that they are receiving on their data sheet is as accurate as possible. What is the capacity range and the overload rating of the torque sensor? One thing to make sure is that you accommodate all peak torques and spikes. In a lot of applications, all that matters is the working torque. But the working torque is just an average of torsional spikes. And these torsional spikes can damage a torque sensor. And if the torsional spikes happen quick enough and the response time of the torque sensor is low enough, you might not even be able to see them in your data. So it is important to know that all to know what the value is of all torque spikes and that your torque sensor can accommodate these, these uh, spikes. What's also important to know about the torque sensor is what the overload ratings are. Typically, the industry standard for safe overload is 200% of full scale. Uh, and catastrophic overload is around 400% of full scale. Catastrophic is usually the point where you might see the fatiguing of bolts or a possible sensor failure, like cracking or bending. Whereas the safe overload at 200% is normally the spot where the sensor will start to yield, but it will take many, many times or instances at this, at this rating for the torque sensor to actually start failing. And this failure can usually be seen in a zero shift. Some vendors will offer 400% overload, safe overload, and 800% catastrophic. But generally speaking, if you, if you raise the overload rating, the stiffness of the torque sensor will usually increase too. And typically, the, resolu the resolution or signal to noise ratio at the low end will decrease. And also, by having a larger overload rating, the sensor usually becomes larger and heavier as well to accommodate this, these larger forces. So what you give up with larger overload rating is you, you give up size and weight along with signal to noise ratio. And then the last but not least is that do you want to measure these torque spikes or just survive them? So you need to make sure that your torque sensor can electrically, the electrical outputs can read what you want to see. If you want to read the torque spikes, you have to make sure that the outputs can go all the way up uh, to the spikes that you want to read. However, if all you're concerned about is measuring uh, the average torque, then there are ways to filter out uh, the spikes so that you can size the torque sensor closer to the average or working torque. And this can be done with torsionally soft members in the drive line, 
or by, by filtering as well, electrical filtering. What is the RPM rating? Uh, most torque sensors on the marketplace are rated between 10,000 and 20,000 RPMs. Uh, typically, when you go up in capacity range, the slower the, the torque sensor, sensor is allowed to spin. And this is mostly due to the weight of the torque sensor and the diameter of the torque sensor. Some torque sensors will show up at the door balanced, and some torque sensors won't. That depends on the, the vendor. Some vendors will balance the torque sensors, and some sens vendors will not. If a torque sensor is balanced, typically a G2.5 balancing rating is, is what the torque sensor is balanced to. Uh, then you have to ask yourself, as far as the RPM rating goes, is does the torque sensor have bearings in it, or do the torque sensor not have bearings? Uh, this usually limits the RPM rating of the torque sensor. And so one good question to ask yourself is, do you want your torque sensor to be a bearing block? Uh, and if it is a bearing block or if it is not a bearing block, that can affect the critical speed of the drive line. So it's important to be aware of that critical speed of that drive line. And the critical speed is the RPM where the drive line actually wants to become a sine wave. And if the, the drive line does go critical, usually the torque sensor will be the first thing to fail uh, in that type of a situation. There are torque sensors that are rated higher than 20,000 RPMs. Uh, an example of one of those torque sensors, as seen below here, is an HBMP11, which is rated to 30,000 RPMs and is made of titanium. What is the output requirement? Uh, depending upon what you're sending a signal to, some data acquisition systems have uh, the ability to read different types of outputs or the limitation to read different types of outputs. On reaction torque sensors or older model slip ring type torque sensors, the outputs are usually millivolt per volt. That's a strain gauge output. Uh, and when using a strain gauge or millivolt per volt output, you can use either AC or DC strain gauge conditioner to excite and then read the information back. Analog outputs are another type. Uh, that would be typically voltage, which is plus or minus 10 volts DC. Uh, amplitude signals are easier or more susceptible to noise. And on more modern torque sensors, a frequency output is also given. That would be 10 kilohertz plus or minus 5 kilohertz, 60 kilohertz plus or minus 30 kilohertz, or 240 kilohertz plus or minus 120 kilohertz. The reason for a frequency output is the delta in time to measure torque is a lot less susceptible to noise than amplitude uh, outputs such as voltage. The lower the frequency, the better the resolution. In other words, a 10 kilohertz output will typically have more resolution than a 240 kilohertz output. Uh, the reason for this is, is when you raise the frequency, you usually generate a little bit more noise down at the low end. And, but one of the advantages of going to a higher frequency output, it lowers the propagation delay of the torque sensor, and it gives you the ability generally to have higher response times. The propagation delay is the time it takes for a torque to happen on the input of the torque sensor and for it to be seen on the output of the torque sensor. And last but not least, uh, some torque sensors come with digital outputs, uh, typically can. Profibus, Profinet, or EtherCAT. Uh, that varies from vendor to vendor where the, whether this type of an output is supplied. But it, if it isn't supplied standard with the torque sensor, usually you can buy an associated piece of electronics to get you to that digital output. Uh, the nice thing about digital outputs are fewer signal conversions, uh, lower data throughput time, and in some instances, capable of higher response times. What is the response time requirement of your application? This is important to know because modern torque sensors generally can be viewed as rotating accelerometers. So if you want to measure, let's say, torsional noise uh, or vibration, that is possible on modern torque sensors. So it's important to know if you want to measure this type of vibration, does your torque sensor have enough response time and a high enough sampling rate to, to measure these torsional vibration. An example of this would be the HBM T12, uh, which samples at 72,000 samples per second. 
And generally, we recommend so that you don't get into an alias situation that uh, the difference or ratio between uh, sampling rate and frequency response should be at least 4 to 1. And in the case of the HBM T12, it is actually 12 to 1. So if it is an application where uh, response time and sampling rate are important, please make sure that your torque sensor can accommodate uh, this type of, of measurement. Environmental considerations such as temperature, dirt, oil, and EMI. All strain gauge based sensors, sensors are sensitive to temperature. So it's important to know that if there is a change in temperature in your environment, is the temperature change a gradient or a soak? A gradient would be a temperature change that comes down the metal shaft, which hits one side of the torque sensor first. So effectively, one side of the torque sensor can be warmer than the other side of the torque sensor. And this will cause the strain gauges, wires, and electronics to change in a different manner than it is as a soak. And a soak would be more like an oven or the air around the torque sensor, which would be more of a uniform change of temperature around the torque sensor. What's also important to know is how the steel sensor is manufactured. If the steel sensor is manufactured properly, it's able to ignore, to some degree, temperature changes. It's important to know how many strain gauges are used on your sensor. The more strain gauges, and if they're laid on the metal sensor properly, it can ignore temperature changes more than if there are a lower amount of strain gauges. And how well does your torque sensor actually pour, perform under changing temperature? Uh, the vendor can usually supply this information. Uh, usually there's data of, of torque sensors being put in ovens and moving the temperature up and down uh, to show how well the torque sensor performs under a changing temperature environment. How is the torque sensor in constructed in terms of protection against dirt and oil and corrosion? Where are all the sensitive parts located? This is important. And how are all those parts protected against the environment? Uh, all torque sensors are made slightly different. Some are more hermetically sealed than others. So, uh, so if you are in a harsh environment, it's important to know to where all the important parts are. How is the data transferred? Is the transfer method susceptible to oils and dirt? Optical sensors or slippering sensors will be more uh, responsive uh, to dirt and oil in hurting the signal transferred back to the stationary world. So optical and slippering sensors are more susceptible to dirt than, let's say, digital telemetry systems. And how immune is the torque sensor to EMI? Uh, torque sensors are inherently antennas. They have wires and coils in them. So proper cabling, shielding, and grounding is very, very important. What kind of signal conditioning is being used on the torque sensor? Uh, is it AC signal conditioning across the Wheatstone Bridge, or is it, or is it DC excitation across the Wheatstone Bridge? Uh, generally, at HBM, we recommend AC strain gauge conditioning. It is a lot more noise immune than using DC strain gauge conditioning. Uh, garbage in, garbage out. So uh, what AC excitation does is it minimizes the the errors that DC can cause, errors due to thermal or 1F noise sources. So it is always good to know that uh, on the torque sensor you're using, what kind of strain gauge conditioning is being used to excite the Wheatstone bridge. Now we'll go over some dynamic considerations, uh, things like why use a rotating torque sensor, what reasons do, why do they exist, uh, some rotational effects, critical speeds, and extraneous loading. Uh, it's important to know that the perfect torque sensor would weigh nothing, have infinite stiffness, and, of no, and have no length at all. Uh, obviously, it's important to produce a torque sensor like that, so it's up to, up to the vendor to make the torque sensor as stiff as possible, as light as possible, and as short as possible. Why inlining torque measurement? Uh, this signature of the diesel engine is an example of torque being measured on a dynamometer, and on this dynamometer there is an inline torque sensor as well as a lever arm and load cell. If the frequency of the oscillating torque is higher than the natural frequency of the dynamometer, 
then the lever arm configuration can act as a mechanical low pass filter, generally around 20 hertz. And in this signature, you'll notice that the lever arm load cell, which is blue, generally will give you a filtered uh, average torque signal, whereas the inline torque sensor, which is in red, will give you a more dynamic torque signal. That is why rotating torque sensors exist, and that is why it is an advantage to use a rotating torque sensor because the, the measurement or the signal becomes more dynamic. Rotational effects, they do exist with rotating torque sensors. And unfortunately, generally, rotational effects aren't listed on the data sheet. Uh, the reason for this is, is that the rotational effects vary depending upon RPM and can vary from application to application. So it's very hard to quantify rotational effects. However, they do exist on every torque sensor. And some companies uh, do compensate for rotational effects. Other vendors do not compensate for rotational effects. So it is important to ask your vendor, uh, what are the rotational effects of the torque sensor and are they compensated for? Do you know the critical speed of the drive line in your application? Uh, is the torque sensor stiff enough? Is it light enough? And is it short enough? All of these contribute to the critical speed of the floating shaft. Uh, when critical, the shaft will act as a sine wave. At a specific RPM, the shaft will run and become unstable. And typically, the torque sensor is the fuse. And in a, in a state where this shaft becomes unstable, the torque sensor is very susceptible, susceptible to mechanical failure, failure, like cracking into two pieces. So it's also always good to do a torsional analysis of your, of your floating shaft before turning uh, the test stand on. Our recommendation is to try to make your test stand as simple as possible, the least parts, the amount of parts, the better. And as you can see here, it is also good to keep the weight as close to a bearing block as possible. In this specific uh, picture, you can see the torque sensor and the coupling are as close to the, to the dynamometer, in this case, or electric motor on the left side. And by keeping the majority of the weight close to a bearing block, it can move your critical speed outside of the measurement range and keep a catastrophic situation from happening. Uh, parasitic loading. Generally, these are axial, axial forces, lateral forces, and bending moment forces that can happen when the rotating shaft is spinning. And it is important to know these forces because it is the highest uh, point of error to a rotating torque sensor, uh, followed by temperature change. So knowing your temperature uh, environment and also the parasitic loads on the torque sensor and eliminating these forces will help you to increase uh, the accuracy or lower the uncertainty of your test stand. And your vendor can help you with understanding these parasitic forces and how they affect the torque sensor and how much error you can expect when these forces are applied to the torque sensor. Uh, most manufacturers on their data sheet will give limits on the parasitic forces. Uh, these limits generally aren't catastrophic, but they are limits that, that start to, when reaching the maximum uh, of these limits, will start to affect the output of the torque sensor. Uh, in the case of these, if you read the fine print on the data sheet, uh, if you reach 100% limit of the extraneous loads, you can expect a 0.3% of full-scale error on your torque sensor. So minimizing the parasitic uh, loading in the application is very, very important. What are the physical limitations of the application? Uh, length and weight. You only have a, uh, a certain amount of space to fit the torque sensor in. Uh, generally, flange to flange torque sensors are shorter, lighter, and more stiff. Circular shaft torque sensors are typically longer and heavier and usually always less stiff. Space requirements, flange to flange, are typically larger in diameter. Circular keyed shafts uh, are typically smaller in diameter, and they allow you to pedestal mount or foot mount the sensor if you do need uh, your 
your floating shaft supported by a bearing block. In other words, your torque sensor can become a bear bearing block, which will change the critical speed of the drive line. And then all torque sensors, it is recommended to use couplings. Uh, the type of coupling used uh, generally is dependent upon how the torque sensor is mounted. Flange to flange torque sensors are generally floating type torque sensors. In other words, they're not foot mounted. And so they usually require one dual flex type coupling. Circular keyed shafts with foot mounts generally, with no foot mount, I'm sorry, generally also require uh, one dual flex coupling. Or a circular shaft that is foot mounted uh, generally requires two dual flex type couplings. And your vendor can help you with the proper coupling method for the particular type of torque sensor uh, that you purchase. Cost or budget requirements. Uh, what usually determines the cost of a torque sensor? Uh, capacity range. When you go up in capacity, usually the torque sensor becomes more expensive. Generally, accuracy, the more accurate, the more expensive. Uh, RPM ratings, if RPM's ratings start going up, uh, that can add cost. Uh, is the torque sensor contact or non-contact? And the amount of outputs that you have on the torque sensor and the type of outputs can affect the cost as well. In rotating torque sensors, uh, pricing usually starts around $2,000 and then works its way up from there. Uh, generally, slip ring square drive type torque sensors are the least expensive uh, and higher capacity non-contact torque sensors like telemetry torque sensors in the kilonewton meters uh, 30 kilonewton meters and up usually start to become the most expensive torque sensors. Uh, and last but not least, we'll go over the type of torque sensors on the marketplace right now, reaction torque sensors or non-rotating. Uh, circular shaft torque sensors, clamp-on, slip ring, and rotary transformers. Uh, Non-contact analog telemetry. Uh, Non-contact digital telemetry. And then last but not least, uh, dual range torque sensors. Reaction torque sensors are non-rotating torque sensors. Uh, these act similar to a lever arm and a load cell, except that you don't obviously need a lever arm or a load cell. It's done with reaction torque. Uh, the advantages of using a reaction torque sensor is usually the cost to implement. Uh, you don't have RPM considerations because the torque sensor isn't rotating. And you don't have to break the rotating shaft and fit a rotating torque sensor and couplings in, which usually leads to less cost. The disadvantages of using reaction torque sensor uh, is usually reduced dynamic response time. The mass of the dynama dynamometer usually acts as a mechanical filter. Uh, you're not measuring true torque in the shaft, but you're measuring torque that is filtered through the dynamometer. Uh, the bearing maintenance of the dynamometer itself, uh, the, daring, the dynamometer will usually have to float on bearings in, in order to measure reaction torque. And then accuracy. Usually, uh, because of all these things, uh, reaction torque sensor will not be as accurate as using an inline torque sensor. Uh, of the rotating torque sensors, what type are there? First, there's the slip ring style torque sensor. This torque sensor was designed probably now about 40 some years ago. Uh, it uses graphite brushes that rub against uh, silver alloy uh, slip rings. Uh, the advantages of using this method is that you can use both AC or DC excitation. Uh, the possibility of higher response times because it is a contact measure method of measuring torque. And because of the circular keyed shaft, there's usually a very low inertia. This type of torque sensor can be made in very low uh, capacity ranges down in the one newton meter or below. Uh, and cost in these lower capacity ranges is usually reasonable. And these type of sensors allow you to foot mount or not foot mount the sensor uh, in case you have to move the critical speed of the drive line around. The disadvantages of this type of torque sensor is stiffness, RPM limitations because of bearings, slip rings, and brushes, uh, bearing maintenance. The bearings will fail over time, wear out, and so the bearings need to be replaced. Uh, brush maintenance. The graphite brushes uh, turn into dust, and if the dust mixes with oil, the oil and dust can lay on the slip rings and cause uh, shorts. So uh, there is brush maintenance involved in, in terms of cleaning. Uh, electrical brush noise, 
and since the shafts are generally keyed, you can get backlash or key imbalance. So uh, these torque sensors, slip rings and brushes 40 years ago were basically the only method of doing it, and so that is why the technology exists, and pretty much nowadays it is, it is more of an obsolete technology. A step up from slip ring torque sensor is rotary transformers. It's basically the same uh, mechanical type torque sensor, except that electrically, instead of using slip rings and brushes, it uses rotary transformers. Uh, one transformer is used to excite the torque sensor. A second transformer is used to take the data back. Uh, it basically has all the same advantages and disadvantages, except for a few. Since there are no slip rings and brushes, there is no brush maintenance. Uh, and because there is, there is no slip rings and brushes, the torque sensors can generally spin at a higher rate because they are non-contact. Uh, the disadvantages of using this type of technology are lower response times. Generally, around 300 hertz of, of frequency response uh, can be expected. And because of the rotary transformers and the gap between the two, uh, these type of torque sensors are sensitive to vibration. And so vibration and misalignment or a thrust force can easily damage the torque sensor. There are clamp-on style torque sensors. Uh, these are generally used when breaking the shaft and putting in an inline torque sensor is not feasible. Uh, the advantages of this is very low cost for very high torque ranges. In other words, if you have a shaft that, let's say, is a foot in diameter or two foot in diameter, it's a lot easier to clamp on a torque sensor onto such a large shaft than to put a rotating torque sensor in there. Uh, it also has the ability to do very low uh, capacity ranges and uh, higher RPM capabilities. The disadvantage is generally you're not measuring torque, but you're measuring deflection uh, in the shaft. And in order to accurately measure the deflection, you have to know uh, how the shaft is manufactured and what the properties are of the shaft so you can do mathematical calculations uh, to get as accurate of torque reading as possible. So it's, it's more used for convenience uh, and not in applications where accuracy is of a very, very high requirement. Then in the early 1990s, analog telemetry uh, came along. A anal uh, analog telemetry became to the point where you could do it in a reasonable cost manner and get a reasonable amount of accuracy out of it. The advantages of going to analog telemetry, uh, it's non-contact data transmission, so it's more of a 24-7 type environment. These type of torque sensors are very, very stiff have virtually no backlash or very low backlash, uh, can have very, very high RPM ratings, uh, a lot less susceptible to noise because of the frequency outputs, uh, and generally weight and length are a lot less than on slip ring style torque sensors or rotary transformer style torque sensors. The disadvantages are is because they're larger in diameter, generally the inertia is a, is a little bit higher. Uh, Analog telemetry systems can be susceptible to nearby metal objects. Uh, and so, in other words, a guard or a shield can act as a secondary antenna and draw power or, action or the signal away from the torque sensor and make the torque sensor non-functional. So it's important to ask your vendor how or if your telemetry torque sensor is susceptible to nearby metal objects. And these torque sensors have higher response times than a rotary transformer type torque sensor. Then over the last, let's say, five to ten years, digital telemetry became a more feasible way of making torque sensors, and so now on the marketplace you can have digital telemetry type torque sensors. A lot of the same advantages as an analog telemetry type torque sensor, but because it is digital and because there is software involved, it allows you to have uh, lower uncertainty, higher response times, uh, and also setup software in order to configure the, the torque sensor. And so these torque sensors will generally have anywhere from 3 kilohertz up to 10 or 15 kilohertz of response time. Uh, and that's the major advantage is noise and response time 
and software setup. And then pretty much the same disadvantages of an analog telemetry torque sensor, except with digital, you're going to have a little bit more conversions depending upon the type of output that you're using. So in other words, you can go from analog across the bridge to digital transmission and then back to an analog signal again. But generally, these torque sensors now are a lot more high tech and a lot more advantageous to use than most any other torque sensors on the marketplace. And then last but not least, dual range torque sensors. There are some vendors that offer dual range torque sensors. Uh, basically, a dual range torque sensor mechanically is impossible to manufacture. As shown in the picture here, in order to have a, two, a true dual range torque sensor, you would have to have, let's say, a 10,000 newton meter bridge, which is larger in size, and then a 1,000 newton meter bridge, which is smaller in size. And if both of these bridges existed on the same torque sensor, once you put 10,000 newton meters on it, you would twist and destroy the smaller bridge. And generally speaking, on rotating torque sensors, it's virtually impossible to overload protect a torque sensor to manufacture this type of configuration. So what's generally done on the marketplace is that you, will, you might have two independent bridges and the smaller bridge will have its own separate calibration and it will have a gain on it uh, to jack up uh, the voltage across the stain gauge bridge and then generally there will be some filtering on it to clean up the noise. And what will then happen is once you put the filtering on it, you have a tendency of affecting your signal to noise ratio at the low end. So it's important to know that, that in most cases, or in, in most all cases, true dual range torque sensors are not possible to manufacture. However, it can be accomplished in the modern torque sensors, the digital torque sensors, through accuracy, accuracy and through software. So you can get a regular torque sensor to act as a dual range torque sensor by configuring it through the software setup. And that is it for our presentation today. Uh, that does not, the presentation does not cover all the topics and what we recommend is you always talk to your, your vendor to answer a lot of these questions in person or over the phone so that your torque sensor uh, does not become inoperable or show catastrophic or electrical failure and that your measurement data that you acquire is the most accurate and least uncertain as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, very much. Everyone, if you have questions for Mark, you can type them into either the Q&A or the chat dialog in WebEx, and we'd be happy to answer those in the next few minutes here. I will get Mark's presentation and distribute it to everyone who attended. In addition, we have been recording the session, and I will notify you when that recording is available on our website for on-demand viewing. First question, Mark, did, does HBM sell the clamp-on style torque sensor? Uh, no, HBM uh, does not. Uh, we uh, are a strain gauge company. We manufacture strain gauges, strain gauges at our facility in Germany, and so all of our sensors are strain gauge based. And as of right now, we do not offer any type of clamp-on torque sensors. All right. What are rotational effects of a torque sensor? Uh, rotational effects uh, can be viewed as, as two different things. One is windage. In other words, the effects of the torque sensor just spinning in air. And then the other type of rotational effects are the effects of the rotating sensor on strain gauges, wires, and the electronics, uh, the actual forces that are involved in spinning a, a sensor. And generally, at higher RPMs, the effect on the torque sensor becomes greater. All right, thank you. Is the T40 an analog or digital type sensor? Uh, the T40 uh, is digital telemetry. However, it is an analog signal across the strain gauge bridge. So we do excite the bridge with AC uh, analog voltage, but it is converted to digital, and ones and zeros are transmitted across the air gap. And then once it's in the stator, 
it can be converted back again to an analog signal or it can be straight digital uh, to some sort of uh, digital output. Okay. Can a torque sensor be damaged without being over torqued? Uh, yes, it can. Uh, I used to work in the service department uh, at a torque sensor company and I actually have seen torque sensors that are cracked into two pieces but yet the Wheatstone bridge is still intact. In other words, they weren't damaged enough to actually break the wires. And so uh, the sensor was physically cracked into two pieces, but the bridge was still intact and the bridge was still in balance. Uh, that usually happens due to uh, vibration where, where uh, uh, the, the torque sensor just resonates to a point where it cracks or fails, but that resonation, but it's not physically overloaded in torque. So the Wheatstone Bridge is not damaged. Interesting. Um, next question is why would I need the TIM-40 with the T-40? Uh, the TIM-40, in order to make the T-40 as less expensive as possible, we took off all of the so-called bells and whistles on the torque sensor. And so basically the torque sensor is just uh, a torque sensor with a frequency and analog plus and minus 10 output. If you want some sort of higher level of output, such as uh, Profibus, EtherCAT, uh, or let's say even Ethernet, uh, the TIM40 communication module is required uh, to convert uh, the analog signal uh, to some type of digital format. The TIM40 also comes with a, a web browser based uh, software that allows you to do some simple setup of the torque sensor as well. All right. Well, everyone, thank you again for, oh, wait, one more question here. Is there an advantage between strain gauge measurement type versus accurate electrical signal measurement technology for torque measurements in electrical motor? For example, uh, by using I'm, if I Yeah, if, if I understand uh, the question uh, correctly, uh, the advantage of using an inline torque sensor is that you're actually measuring torque in the inline shaft. Uh, so it's a dynamic measurement and you're measuring true torque. Uh, other methods of measuring torque uh, generally are not, you're not measuring too, true torque, but you're measuring some kind of, of altered version of that torque, whether it's through the mass of the dynamometer or whether it's electrically, let's say, by measuring uh, the amperage that the motor is drawing. Uh, and generally those methods of, of measuring torque are a lot less accurate than measuring the true torque in a rotating shaft. I uh, hope I answered that one uh, correctly. All right, the next question. Typically, what is the percent error between the true torque on the shaft and measured torque in reaction type torque sensors? Well, the reaction torque sensor has a piece of calibration data that shows how accurate it is. But again, kind of like a load cell and lever arm, is that there is a floating motor, let's say, that the uh, that the reaction torque sensor is supporting. And so the torque is going through the mass of that electric motor before it gets to the reaction torque sensor. And the mass of that electric motor can act as a mechanical low pass filter. And so generally you're getting more of a working torque or a filtered torque than you are a true dynamic torque. Uh, and, and that is the reason for an inline torque sensor is to measure true dynamic torque in the inline shaft. All right. Which HBM sensor is least susceptible to motor drive noise? Well, it's, it's our responsibility as a vendor to make the torque sensors as immune to noise as possible. Uh, and we do that through the electronics that uh, we put inside the torque sensors. HPM makes some of the most accurate calibration equipment in the world and that same electronic is used on our, on our torque sensors. Uh, so the, the torque sensors are inherently noise immune uh, because of the electronics that we use and because of the excitation methods that we use. Uh, but what we always ex uh, stress is the proper cabling and the proper shielding of the cable. Uh, you can also purchase with an HPM torque sensor cabling that is specifically designed to go with our torque sensors uh, that is immune to, to oils and fluids and is also has uh, the least amount of capacitance and resistance 
to minimize uh, noise pickup. So, the, but things that are out of our control is how the shielding is terminated and how the cables are routed. And all of that is important to minimizing uh, the noise on the electrical line. All right. Well, Mark, thank you again. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. We're at the end of our time today. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon.